to, to find a place where we can go for a pilgrimage, where we could hike because that was the highest peak. And, uh, and we were just looking for a place to go for a pilgrimage uh, for Our Lady, and that was a site that we had identified. Yeah, I thought you were a teenager. Huh? No, I was still a kid. I was still a young boy. Anyway, we are live. Good morning, everybody. It's Monday morning, the beginning of another week for us. Hello. I hope you had uh, a good weekend. Um, we had plenty of fun over the weekend. It was a busy weekend, uh, guests at home and, uh, and swimming and uh, all that yesterday. Uh, for some of uh, our homeschooling friends, it was the last hurrah <laughs> before we finally dip into the uh, uh, rigors of uh, homeschooling. But anyway, we had a lot of fun uh, yesterday and that was great. So today, folks, uh, we'll talk about faith. Okay? The gospel for today uh, comes from St. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 10. And here goes. It's a long gospel, but we'll... here goes. It says, When Jesus had finished all his words to the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave who was ill and was about to die. And he was valuable to him. When he heard about Jesus... The centurion, when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and save the life of his slave. They approached Jesus and strongly urged him to come, saying, He deserves to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he built a synagogue for us, and Jesus went with them. But when he was only a short distance from the house, the centurion sent friends to tell him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you enter under my roof. Does anybody recall where uh, we say that? Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you enter my roof. Huh? Okay, yeah, see? When, when, before, uh, before we receive communion, right? Before we receive communion. Uh, this is the prayer that we repeat, saying, Lord, I'm not worthy that you would come under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed, right? So this is the centurion. We borrow this act of faith. We borrow this act of faith from the centurion, okay, who asked Jesus um, or who wanted Jesus to cure his slave. For I am not worthy that you uh, to have you enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not consider myself worthy to come to you. See, he did not even consider himself worthy to come and approach Jesus himself. That's why he sent the elders of the Jews and some, some of his friends to go and approach Jesus and ask for that favor. But say the word. See, here it is, a continuation. Say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too... Okay, listen to this. For I too am a person subject to authority, with soldiers and sub subject to me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come here, and he comes here. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning, said to the crowd following him, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When the messengers returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. So Jesus performed the miracle for the centurion. Okay? For the centurion who had who loved his his servant. The centurion loved his servant and wanted uh, to the best for his servant. That's why he went to great lengths trying to reach to reach out to Jesus and ask Jesus to. Um, to cure the centurion. Now this centurion had expressed had expressed faith. See, this is what we call the virtue of faith. Okay? Now I want us to examine uh, today a little bit about the virtue of faith and what it really means so that we understand it. Okay? What, what, what does the virtue of faith really mean for us? Okay? First of all, the virtue of faith is um, is a theological virtue, right? Together with what other virtues? The two of them? 
Okay, hope and charity, right? Faith, hope, and charity. They come uh, together. And they are a gift that comes with what sacrament? Baptism. Right from baptism, right? The supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Okay. Now, but that faith, although it is a gift from God, and it is infused in our soul at baptism, well, just like, just like anything that is alive and should be alive and organic in us, it should also be nurtured and it should be made to grow. Right? It should be nurtured and made, made to grow. Otherwise, it will die a natural death. Right? Just like any plant, you know, this whole weekend we've been trying to uh, reposition our plants in the backyard and uh, we threw away those that have died and, and uh, withered and all that. Well, there's only one reason why those things died, really, right? It was because of our lack of attention during the summer. Right? Summer here was so hot and we were not, uh, we did not pay much attention to our plants. A lot of them died. Hey, they weren't able to survive. Now, the faith is the same way. Faith is the same way. If we don't nurture our faith, if we don't feed our faith, it is going to die. Okay? It's going to die. Now, let's, let's review the catechism a little bit and, and see what the catechism tells us about faith so that we understand how we can make it grow and how we can nurture it. Okay? The catechism point 143 says, Man, by faith, man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. Submits his intellect and his will to God. With his whole being, man gives his assent to God the revealer. Sacred scripture calls this human response to God, the author of Revelation, the obedience of faith. See, it's curious how in talking about faith, there's another virtue that gets involved in having faith. It is the virtue of obedience. Right? So faith is the ascent, the ascent, the, the submission. Okay? To submit means, how do we understand submit? What does that mean? We were talking about obedience just uh, a few days ago. Huh? To what? To turn in, to surrender, right? To put under the authority of somebody. Yeah, to be under the authority of somebody, that is what obedience means. Now, look at how the, the Catechism defines faith. It is the complete submission of the intellect and the will to God. Okay? It is the whole being of man, the whole being of man, primarily, okay, primarily driven by his intellect and his will. Because those are the highest faculties of the human being, right? The intellect and the will. Those are the most important faculties that define us as a human being. Okay? Uh, that's the dif big difference between us and an orangutan or, or a dog or a cow. We have intellect and will. Okay? And that is what we submit to God completely okay? through faith. Okay, now let's, uh, let's uh, read a little bit more from the Catechism. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, okay, we, we read, and this is where the definition of faith actually comes from. Okay? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Okay? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Assurance, conviction. Okay? Assurance, conviction, meaning that what we believe in, the things that we believe in through our faith, okay, are things that are true. There is assurance that they are true. Okay? And we are convinced of them. Okay? That is what faith is all about. We get convinced that they are actually true. Okay? So faith is not believing things that we do not really know about. Okay? There is an element of assurance that what we are believing in are true. Okay? That the things that we are hopeful for, like the things that, 
God has revealed to us okay, that, that there is such a thing as heaven, that there is uh, the hope of going to heaven if we live our lives in a saintly way, see? that there is such a thing as resurrection, that there is such a thing as eternal life. See? These things, we hope for them because there is an assurance that they are true. Okay? There's a conviction. We are convinced that they are true. And how do we know that they are true? I think that's the big question for plenty of people, right? How do we know that they, these things we believe in are true? And I'm going to demonstrate this to you in a simple way. Mia, when is your birthday? October 7. October 7. It's coming up, right? The Feast of the Holy Rosary. Mia, Mia. How do you know you were born on October 7? Same question to all of you. How do you know you were born on October 7? Or no, sorry, you were born on your own birthdays. How do you know? I didn't know that. Chevelle, what is that? Because I told you. Very good. That's my five-year-old. Chevelle says, because you told us. Now, Chevelle. Is that enough for you to believe that you were born on when's your birthday? When is your birthday? Huh? Your mouth is full. Your mouth is full. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Don't talk when your mouth is full. But you just answered my question. Anyway, Chevelle was born in January 7. Another 7. October 7 for Mia, January 7 for Chevelle. Now, she said. She believes that she was born on January 7 because I told her. Right? Because I told her. And what about the rest of you? Is that the only reason why you believe you were born on the day we tell you you were born? Huh? What else, Joe? Because mommy told us. Oh, because mommy told us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you silly. Anyway, the whole point is, the whole point is, in demonstrating what faith is, you all believe that your birthday is such because your parents told you, right? You, you had the assurance, you had the assurance of the truth behind that simple uh, fact of being born on a certain date because you relied on the word of your parents. Now, folks, the same thing is true with us. In matters of faith, when it comes to faith, the only reason why we believe what we believe in is because we are convinced of the authority of God, the revealer, see, as the definition here says, right? The, the, the revealer revealed it to us. See? God, God who, can, uh, who cannot deceive and can ni neither can be deceived nor... Uh, uh, deceive us <laughs> I'm, I'm mixing up my words here because I'm trying to look for it uh, in the catechism here okay we believe the things that we believe in because of the authority of God who reveals them okay? that is the basis of our faith really okay? we believe what we believe in because of the authority of God himself who reveals them who can neither deceive nor be deceived. That is point 156 of the Catechism. Okay? Catechism of the Catholic Faith. That is how uh, it is defined. So, and that is something that the centurion himself has expressed right here in this Gospel. When he said, when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him to ask the favor. Right? When he heard about Jesus. Okay? So, there must have been, you see, uh, Jesus, in, in another gospel where, where uh, a few days back, see, we read how uh, the, the, uh, the gospel precisely said, right? Jesus spoke with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees who didn't seem to have authority because they had no credibility, right, among the Jews. But Jesus was different. He spoke with authority. That is why the Jews followed him, see? And that is the basis, not only the faith of, the, of this centurion right here, but the faith of all of us. When we hope for the things that we haven't even seen, 
See? We are expressing faith because we believe in the authority of Jesus Christ who revealed all of these things to us. We, re we believe in the authority of God himself who revealed these things to us. All the way from Abraham, right? Who, was, who is the father of all the faithful. The father of all uh, of us in faith. The model of all of us in faith. God, Abraham himself believed God and the revelations of God to him. Okay? Now, uh, and, and the basis is that. The authority of the revealer. The authority of God. Now, practical question here for all of us, right? Since we're talking here about Catholic best practices... The, the, the practical question for all of us here would be this. How do we make our faith grow? You see, folks, when we, when we get baptized, right? God already puts the seed of baptism in our soul, right? The theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity when we get baptized. So as early as that time when we get baptized, God already puts the seed of, of faith in there, the gift of faith. He already invests in us. And puts the seed of faith in there. But it is our duty now to make that faith grow. Okay? To make that faith grow. And how do we make it grow? Okay, I have three recommendations to how to make it grow. Okay? Number one, study. Number two, study. And number three, <laughs> study. Okay? There is no substitute but to study, study, study. Okay? We need to study our faith. And there is no other way around it if we want our faith to grow, if we want to be serious with making our faith alive and keep it alive in our lives, we need to study. And like a broken record, you will have heard it here in this broadcast time and again, I would encourage everybody to begin from the catechism. The catechism, the catechism, the catechism is the most basic thing we can study. You know, folks, nowadays it's very common. We hear it all the time. We hear it all over the place and it's being uh, promoted even in our parishes, you know. Uh, study Bible study left and right, you know, let's study the book of uh, Job, the book of uh, Daniel, the book of I don't know who in the Old Testament, and uh, let's study this and that. You know, folks, all of those things are very good. All of those things are very good and commendable. But you know what? I will repeat it to you. I've already said it before. They would not really make much sense for most people, if we don't even know the catechism. And the, and the reason is very simple. The reason is simple. That's how the mind works. That's how faith works. You see, everything begins from a seed and grows to a seedling and grows to a, you know, before it becomes a tree, before it grows to a mature tree. So before we even try to, to, uh, to try to nourish our faith with a deeper understanding of biblical passages and, 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 and uh, you know, whatever it is, left and right, uh, we have to understand the basics. We begin from the catechism. And that's why, look, even, even here in this broadcast, while we, while we comment on, uh, on the gospel for the day, notice my approach here. I always go back to what the catechism says. I always try to highlight what the catechism teaches us so that we really get to understand the basics. Because it's only by understanding these basics of our faith that we can grow into mature Christians and mature Catholics in our faith. If we omit the basics and jump into the more complicated stuff, we are... <laughs> The, number one, the approach is wrong. Number two, we won't benefit much out of it. Okay? Now, the other thing that I would like us to understand here is this. Faith is not, is not, and I would repeat it uh, many times, it's not an emotional thing. Okay? Faith is not an emotional um, uh, affectation. It's not a question, I feel good with my faith, or I feel good that God has mercy on me, or I feel good. And it's a, uh, uh, that's not faith. That is not 
faith. Faith is based on solid, real understanding. Knowledge. Knowledge. Okay? Faith is based on knowledge. And it is nurtured by continuous knowledge. Okay? If we do not feed it with knowledge and, and, uh, and uh, real substance, okay? and we just go by, the, by our feelings and our emotions, well, there's a danger of collapse. There's a danger of us not sustaining that so-called faith because it is not built on solid ground. It is not built on solid uh, knowledge. Okay? So, uh, you know, just uh, a few days back, we were talking to uh, a family that told us, you know, we lost our son. How? I thought he died. Uh, no, he, he lost the faith. That he went to the university and got exposed to all of the communist teachers in the university and he lost his faith. I kept to myself, but really, uh, I was just thinking to myself, you know what? That kid didn't lose his faith when he went to the university. He has long lost his faith while he was with you, dear parents, because perhaps you didn't nurture his faith at home. You did not feed him what he needed to be fed for his faith at home. You had neglected your duty as a parent to be the first teachers of your children at home. You fed them meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but you didn't feed their souls with what was needed for faith. And so, when your college kid took off, went to college, Guess what? Those communists and college lecturers fed him, fed his empty soul and his empty mind with their own ideologies. And, where did it <laughs> and it made sense to him because his faith never made sense to him to begin with because we did not teach them what they needed to know. And you know what else, folks? When your kid goes off to college and loses his faith, he didn't really lose his faith in God. You know what he lost faith in? He lost faith in you, his own parents. That is the real story. He lost faith in his own parents who did not teach him anything and rather clung to his professor's ideological teachings and believed them because they provided him some substance that he otherwise could have had at home with you. So I guess best Catholic practice for us today, study, study, study our faith. Let us not neglect the study of our faith and do it at home. Parents, it is your obligation. It is our obligation to teach our own children at home with beginning from the wealth of information and, uh, 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 that we could find in the catechism. Okay, that's it for us, folks. We went over time. I'm sorry. But anyway, <laughs> we're off to Mass. Have a good day, everybody. And I uh, hope you start a good week trying to study the catechism. Bye-bye.